Oh, I'm in the screen, you guys can't see. Here we go. Department of Mathematical Sciences, John H. Conway, The Free Will Theorem. The two theories that revolutionized physics in the 20th century, relatively to the quantum mechanics, are full of predictions that defy common sense. Recently, Conway and Simon Cochin Cochin used three such paradoxical ideas to prove the free will theorem. Can anything be proven oh, about free will? I don't know, I can't hear myself either. I'm just going to wait for you. Wait until I'm going to be quiet. Do a funny dance or something. Yeah, that's good and quiet. Okay, cool. Um, whatever you were talking about is probably more important, but there's more of you listening to me. So, uh, John Conway is giving a presentation. Who's John Conway? Famous mathematician. Uh, yeah, apparently a famous mathematician, and it's about free will. If indeed humans have free will, then elementary particles already have their own small share of this valuable commodity. Woo. So I guess he's going to debate about whether uh, electrons have a tiny component of free will. In my opinion, that's a whole bunch of woo magic. Uh, I just think that's nonsense, but I'm not John Conway, right? I mean, I'm not... I am, that's true, but I'm not the John von Neumann Professor of Mathematics at Princeton. No, hold on, but he's a master of philosophers. Okay. I mean, the free will theorem has been proven. I don't know, it sounds terribly fascinating. I think I... Oh, I think it's stuck over there. There we are. Anyway, if you're into that kind of thing, it'd be really interesting, I'm sure, you can show up and hear weird sci-fi stuff and a proof, and maybe we can debate it. I'd really love someone to bring it back and tell me what it's about, because I got kids and I'm not going. <laughs> so, do you, do you know about the game of life? I do. It, is this it. the Conway of Conway's, Conway's Game of Life? Right. Yes. Yeah. That's oh, why it's a wow. Yeah. Okay, this guy's huge then. <laughs> so, yeah, underneath this picture it says. <laughs> okay, let's look that up just because that's interesting. Um, you should pull out one where you can like the initial position. Yeah. Conway's Game of Life. Oh, that's right. Right. The website. Yeah, this one's good? Okay, let's give it a shot. Okay, behold Conway's Game of Life. Um, the thing that's cool about this... Whoa, what happened? <laughs> Stupid Linux. Why do people want multiple desktops? Okay. Um, so Conway's Game of Life is governed by something like three rules. And they're very simple, like wherever there's a dot, it makes the dots next to it. Does anybody know the rules? Yeah, three dots suffocate. It's the surrounding dots, there's eight total, right? Yeah, there's eight total, and if there's... And so if there's three, it'll suffocate. If there's less than... If you're by yourself, you die by yourself. Yeah, exactly. I don't remember the exact rule. And if it was like very simple rules, but they leave them really complex. Okay, so okay. I, make, I make a few dots. According to Wikipedia, in each live cell with fewer than two live neighbors dies, because of loneliness, any life cell with two or three live neighbors lives on. Any life cell with more than three neighbors dies because of overpopulation. Any dead cell with exactly three live neighbors become a live cell by the reproduction. Okay, so this guy made up some silly rules and decided to see what happens in a computer, and look what happens. Next, something different, something different, something different, and all of a sudden, <coughs> stuff is happening. And the fact that it's just living on and replicating. You can hit start and it will run automatically. Okay, let's do that. Um, you can increase uh, the speed to the right of that. All right. 
So that's kind of amazing. I just clicked randomly, and this thing is living on and doing stuff. And some of it Go seems fit. kind of intelligent at some point. Yeah, so people have studied Conway's game of life for a long time, seeing if this is, these are the fundamental rules necessary for a universe that can support life. Is it? Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? Exactly. I don't quite understand how you get that from. Maybe, maybe these things will develop consciousness. I don't know. But all they're doing is they keep iterating over it and they keep applying these rules. If there's a lone dot, it dies. If there's three together, they produce offspring or suffocate. And if there's four of them, something else happens. And <laughs> just following these rules, stuff happens. And look, it's generated spinners and it's produced these poop pellets. And this thing is uh, behaving weirdly. Um, so this makes people ask, is the real universe like Conway's game of life? If so, could abiogenesis occur in Conway's game of life? And if so, did it occur in the real universe? Um, did you did con word? abiogenesis? <clears throat> ah, yes. <laughs> abiogenesis. What? You guys don't know the word abiogenesis? Come on. I'm abiogenesis, but I'm probably wrong. I bet you're more right. Hey, I'm not wrong. Abiogenesis or abiogenesis? Abio or abio? Apparently we're both right. <laughs> it's either abio or abio. Okay. Um, origin of life. Abio is... Oh, it's like biology? Abio? as in life, and Genesis as in the beginning. In the beginning there was Conway's game of life or whatever. Okay, the study of abiogenesis. I like a bio now that I know that bio is in biology. What'd you, I, you didn't think of the etymology? Word history? I, no. <laughs> involves three main types of considerations, physical, chemical, and biological. Basically, abiogenesis is the beginnings of evolution. Um, we can see that evolution happens, but nobody has a clue what happened in the beginning. And, uh, and by a clue, I mean from a scientific, empirical, reproducible, verifiable perspective. And so, that's interesting. This guy discovered something, holy cow, it's still going. So, someone made a Turing machine in the of life. Yeah, so people have proven all kinds of weird things about this. They've proven that you can implement a Turing machine in Conway's Game of Life. They've proven you can make uh, pellet generators. They've made entities that reproduce themselves perfectly and keep reproducing themselves. And this was studied a lot in the 1960s and 70s, and then people thought that was dumb and moved on. So, I don't know. It's still fascinating, and he's a guy that's been around the block about 50,000 times, so, hey, look at this thing. It's learned to crawl. <laughs> I don't know what it's doing, but it's going to collide. Oh, it died. <laughs> but it's amazing how interesting, how much complexity can evolve from simple rules, and that has implications in artificial intelligence, does it not? Because this is artificial, and it looks like it's alive. It's certainly not intelligent. <laughs> but weird. <laughs> it keeps producing these things, and they seem to be stable. Until it absorbs them. That's cool. Was cool. Okay. Enough Conway's Game of Life. We could be amused by that all day. Um, uh, but today, something about Fermati Prime thingies. All right. Today, the ones about Fermat Primes on the 7th is Conway. So if you're interested in Fermat Primes, go today, soon after class. If you're interested in hearing Conway speak, go on Thursday. Um, I put that for you on our schedule. There you go. Please somebody go, because I want to hear about it, <laughs> just so I can debate it and say why it's so wrong, which is totally unfair to Conway, because he won't even need it. Okay, getting to the midterm. I have to confess, I did not finish grading your midterms. I'm sorry. Uh, some person who's unable to learn 
stuck another utility <coughs> theory question on there. <laughs> and now he's suffering from having to grade it. <coughs> and I had thought that, <coughs> all right, let's just let's start recording. <coughs> OK, now I'm recording. Let's do it. And it's open. Here's our midterm. Anybody notice this? That's supposed to be a two. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> noticed it. Okay. Replace it replace it replace replace one. Are you going to like replace our midterm one? Keep my midterm. It said one. No, it was just a typo. Okay. Put your name on the back. You all know how to do that. Number two. Okay. Um, did you not see this coming? We did. Doesn't mean we were both perfect. Yeah, okay. Here's where this came from. I was going to stick the wall market problem on, and then I thought to myself, no. <laughs> that one caused problems, so I decided to rewrite it. Uh, suppose you want to dig for emerald. Do you purchase a round trip ticket for $900? You notice how you've already purchased, just like in the Walmart problem, you've already bought these pens. I tried to just translate it one for one. It was supposed to be the same problem. But somewhere in there it evolved a little and turned out to be a different tree. But there was the concept of you've already spent something and that doesn't affect anything at all. If you decide to proceed with your plans, that's the same thing as in the wall market one of should you send a coupon or should you not send a coupon. And there's a cost to it. You have to purchase digging equipment just like in the coupon thing. You have to pay the coupon and you get a lower profit if you use the coupon. Um, and there's odds if you do it, and whether you choose to do it affects your odds. Except something went different and now it worked out a little different. But you see now it's kind of the same reasoning process at least. So I thought you'd all be prepared because you'd all review the wall market problem. That was my reasoning. <coughs> well, let's do it. <clears throat> so it sounds like there won't be more of these on the final. Um, I want you to understand how to do this. I just want you to all get it right on the final so that I won't have to have a hard time grading it. I can just check the right answer. Yeah. By the way, um, make it a take home final so you have more time. Ooh, that's not a bad idea, maybe. It's a great idea. I still won't know how to do this properly. <laughs> See, <laughs> let's, let's go through it and hopefully you will know how to do them better. It, in the, after the first assignment, um, excuse me, after midterm one, a small portion of the class got the question right. Uh, maybe this question is easier. Do you think it was easier? Yes. yes. No. It was more clear. OK. Yeah, that, yeah. Dang. Yeah. I was hoping it was about equal. OK. Well, a lot more of you got it right. And so there are fewer that I need to spend hours with agonizing over how much partial credit to give you. By the final, I hope everyone will get them all right. <laughs> I've thought about this for a long time. I've come to the conclusion the problem is Algebra 2. Am I wrong? In Algebra 2, do you remember the story problems? And you all hated the story problems because story problems. And I think you were never properly taught how awesome story problems are. This is where math meets reality. And the whole reason math stinks is because everyone that teaches math teaches it in stupid equations. You know how many jobs there are in the real world where you do equations in symbolic form on paper all the time? Math teacher. Math teacher? <laughs> and? Math teacher. Uh, no, that's about it. I mean, that is not what math is. Math is doing real things. So, suppose you want to dig for emeralds in Venezuela. Who cares? You have already purchased a round trip plane ticket to Venezuela for $900. Irrelevant. If you decide to proceed with your plans, you'll need to purchase digging equipment for $600. Okay. That's a change. Should we do ASCII art here? Is this going to work? Uh, no. ASCII art. we got to learn how to use the drawing tools. That's the real question. Ooh, there's drawing tools in OpenOffice. Can't believe that works. I have never tried this before. Okay, so what do we got? Go and stop. Come on, right here. That's asking a lot. Stay. Okay. 
Those are your choices. You may go or you may stay. If you go, you have to purchase digging equipment for $600. Minus $600. Okay. You estimate there's a 0.1 chance that you will find $100,000 worth in emeralds. Okay, so it's pretty clear that at this point, if you go, you might find emeralds. And you might not. I will label these find and don't understand how this works. I would like to. It's like all word processors suck at doing stuff. No find. Okay. If you find, you get $100,000 worth of emeralds. So plus 100K. And a 0.9 chance you will find only worthless dirt. Okay, so this is 0 0.1 and this is 0 0.9. This one is worth 0. This one is worth 0. Okay. <coughs> If you try to bring emeralds back on your return flight, you estimate there's a 95% chance the custom officer will discover them hidden in your luggage and confiscate them, leaving you with nothing. That's a long-winded way of saying something bad happens if you find emeralds. Um, is it clear that it's not a threat if you found nothing? I think that's pretty clear. That basically, ooh, it joined my corners together. So 0.95 chance, if you found them, that you end up with nothing. And what's this, 0.05 chance, if you found them, that you keep your, well, I guess since I already added 100K, here I'll have to say minus 100K, and then here I'll say nothing. Is that how you want to do it? There's lots of ways to do it, um, a lot of people, just put values down at the leaf nodes, and then at the leaf nodes you calculated all the things that would happen, and so this one would have 100k and this one would have zero, and there'd be nothing intermediate. That works too. However you want to express yourself, that's fine. We're just trying to translate this into a tree. Right? There was also the option of writing off Yeah, well now's where it gets interesting. You have the minus 600 all in, you know, by the way. Yeah, sorry, never mind. That's correct, I do. And I'm leaving it there. Any objections? Okay. Okay. I think you only buy the digging equipment if you yeah. go. Okay. All right. Um, <coughs> now, actually, before we move on, let's just see what this works out to because I think this is in, it's informative to kind of get the big picture. If this were the case, if this is the, the full story, should you go? No. You already know that. How do you know that? Well, let's do it. So there's a 0 0.05 <coughs> chance of getting 100,000, right? Yeah. So that's worth about $5,000. And there's only a 0 0.1 chance you'd even find it. And it cost us $600 to try. There's a negative $100 utility of going to Venezuela. And there's a zero utility of staying. So which should you do? You should stay. Even though you bought a plane ticket. Doesn't that rub you wrong? You should go and sightsee. <laughs> you could go and sightsee. Maybe there's value there. But that wasn't. We're going to assume there are no other relevant factors or consequences. So sightseeing is not an option. Or it has no value to you. Basically, if you go, you're going to get $100 poorer. So $900 lost plus lose $100. Or $900 lost plus lose $0. Which do you do? Zero. Zero is better. If this were the whole problem, you should stay. And what that means is, this option goes away. Oof. But there's another chance. However, however, my kids watch Veggie Tales. This is an episode where they sing about however. 
Nobody knows what I'm talking about. Okay. Um, if you pay the customs officer a bribe of $200, so right here we're going to add minus 200. Before he inspects your luggage, the chances you'll discover the hidden bounty change to X. So instead of 0.95, they become X. <coughs> and what does this side become? 1 minus X. 1 minus X. For what value of X would it be better to just throw your plane ticket in the garbage? OK. Have I set up the tree right? I think most of you could set up the tree right. I've looked, I've, I have not finished grading them, so I'm still not certain where you're all at. But at a glance, I saw a whole bunch of trees that looked kind of like this. I'm pretty sure they'll be just right as soon as I look closer. So closer at are you just ignoring the don't bribing the officer branch? Yeah, because don't bribing the officer is apparently a waste of your time. Okay. We've already shown that. It's, it has a utility of negative $100 to not bribe the officer. Okay. And negative $100 is worse than zero, so zero is a better choice, which is throw your plane ticket in the garbage. <laughs> So my problem was trying to figure out where to collapse, I think. Yeah. So like, I would take, I feel like you could have done it multiple ways, and obviously risk one of them was right, but um, <laughs> do you collapse it at the step before the minus 100 zero at the very bottom? Or would you, like, where do I subtract the 200 from? Okay. So does 200 get subtracted from like 9,000 ish, or does it get subtracted from the whole 100,000? So I want to claim that you're right, there are multiple ways you can do it, but I will also claim that no matter which way you do it, as long as you do it right, <laughs> they will all result in the same equations, they're, they'll all come out to the exact same answers. And if you want me to prove that, I'll show you a few different ways of doing it and show that they all come up to the same numbers. Um, but let's start by doing it one way. And then after we're done, we can maybe do another way just to show you that. But yeah, it really shouldn't matter whether you put the 200 here or whether you put it in all the leaf nodes. Um, I, you just gotta be consistent with the story. And I claim no matter how you do it, you come up with the same answer. Let's, let's test that. Let me, let's look at this. If you pay the customs officer a bribe of $200 before he inspects your luggage, where could we put that minus 200 and have it be valid. <laughs> Basically, these are the chances he'll find it in your luggage, so it kind of has to be there. Or we could just subtract 200 here and change this to a minus 200. That's the same thing, right? Yeah. It'll work out the same in the end, so it <coughs> doesn't matter. I like to not repeat things, so I like to do it this way. Just because I like to minimize my wording. OK. Um, I guess, yeah, before we even turn this into equations, I do want to ask, how does your tree differ from this? How, how does, if you read these words, 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 and you write the tree, is there any other tree structure that, that's rational that isn't equivalent somehow? Yeah. Yeah. That your node that has 100k minus 200, I actually have another decision like go or stay. Or bribe or no bribe. Okay. I did too. I just ignored I the, did that too. Uh, <clears throat> let's write it that way. I think that's informative. So, uh, okay. I'm going to mix these. Not you, but I'm going to mix these. And let's do, you have a choice here bribe. And no bribe. Now, if you bribe, now there's some chance that it'll be found and some chance that it won't be found. Like that? Yes. I like that better. I think that's even slightly more consistent with the story, so let's go with it. OK, um, so this option is now find, and this is no find. Oh, Brad, I already used find and no find. This is a pilot oh, find emeralds and downloads. The customs oh, officer finds uh, emeralds. Lucky and not lucky. Uh, Say sneaky. <laughs> sneaky and not 
and caught. Uh, caught and you caught and caught a knot. Thank you. Caught. <laughs> okay. If you're caught, you lose 100k. If not, you get nothing. Let's add five cents because four cents because it makes you feel awesome that you got away with it. But you said no, that would mess up my problems. No, no, okay, no other details. Besides, I think the moral guilt should weigh I think so too. Fortunately, there are no other relevant factors or consequences. You're right. By the way, please do not derive your moral decisions <laughs> from the stupid utility theory questions we do in this class. It's a business expense. It is. Okay. Yeah. Work morality into your numbers somehow. <laughs> and make sure that you weight morality properly or else your answers will be immoral. Okay. Great. Now, a lot of people ended up and by a lot of people, again, I've only looked at several, but uh, a lot of people on this bribe and no bribe put 95% on one side and 5% on the other, meaning there's a 95% chance that you're going to bribe and a 5% chance that you're not going to bribe. What happened? Basically, someone was confused, right? Because that's not the probability that you're going to bribe. What's the probability that you're going to bribe? It's either 0 or 100%. And it depends because you're highly capable of utility theory, haven't taken this class, right? I guess if we factor in the possibility you'd make a mistake, it's something other than that. But um, it should be 0 or 100%. And we should know which one we are. We've already determined you're definitely not going to know bribe. That came out really confusing. Um, <laughs> we know this is a bad option because, oh, I didn't finish drawing the tree. Uh -huh. If you know bribe, then there is here a 0.95% chance and a 0.05% chance. And down here, there's a minus 100k, and here there's a 0k. OK. Do you need a minus 200 somewhere, like under the bribe node? I do, thank you. I hit enter, crap. Minus 200. Thank you for helping me align my tree with your trees. Are, are you all in agreement that if I solve this now, you will understand? Because this looks like what you did, or at least you now understand why it should look like that. All in agreement. Good. OK. What's the utility of this getting to this particular branch right here, where the cursor is moving? So it's minus 100k times 0.95 plus 0.05 times 0 minus $995,000. That's not great, especially since if you take that from 100k, that's $500, subtract the $600, it's going to come out negative. That's not a great option. It's going to work out better to go this way. We kind of already know that, but we can determine it for sure. Um, I will put utility in square brackets. All right, is that what it was? Minus 95,000? There we go. The utility of no bribe is negative 95,000. What is the utility of bribe? Minus x. We don't know, but we're going to solve for it. <coughs> x times minus 100k plus 1 minus x <coughs> times 0. I'm just going to remove that term. Everybody okay with that? Yeah. Tink. Okay, plus 100k. Oops, I forgot my minus 200. Minus $200 plus 100k. This whole thing ends up getting multiplied by 0.1 plus 0.9 times 0, right? Because I'm now up here. I'm collapsing up this tree. 
and that gets a minus 600 equals zero. Right, I'm saying make this branch have the same utility as that branch. You see why I'm doing that? Okay. Um, what can I say here? A lot of people took this minus 600 and that minus 200 and merged them together into minus 800. I have definitely seen a lot of those. Why did that happen? Because you'll only pay the bribe if you've actually found something to bribe to keep. Yeah, if you pay the 600, you're going to go dig. That doesn't mean you're going to find. There's a 0.1 chance you'll find, 0.9 chance you don't. Why are you going to pay a bribe if you don't find anything? I think that point was missed in a lot of cases. So um, I think that's a pretty intelligent mistake. Nevertheless, it's a mistake. There you go. 600 and that 200 cannot be combined because there's these times 0.9 over here and the times 0.1 over here. Okay. Um, that threw you off by a large factor, made the answer very wrong. Essentially, we solved for zero. Now, we actually want, let's ask the question, the slightly harder question, under what conditions should we go? We'll go if this is greater than zero, right? A lot of you did inequalities and forgot to flip the inequality, so that's why I'm doing that, just so we can show that. Okay, let's do the math. I'm going to move that 600 to the other side. Did I do that correctly? Okay, please catch my mistakes. I keep making them. I'm going to just drop this term because 9 times 0, 0 0.9 times 0 is worthless. Okay? I'm going to divide both sides by 0 0.1. What happens when you divide by 0 0.1? Multiply by 10. So this is greater than 6,000, right? I guess I've dropped my dollar signs now. I'll remember their dollars. Mm -hmm. All right, let's subtract uh, 100K from both sides. What's 6,000 minus 100K? I need a calculator. 6,000 minus 100, 1, 2, 3, negative 94K. Negative 94k. Okay, I'm going to add 200 to both sides. 38. Oops, I forgot to copy the line. We are getting close to having this solved, right? What do I do next? Let's divide by negative 100k. That's going to flip my sign. Negative 100k, <coughs> 0.938. <coughs> so I get x is less than 0 0.938. Make it big, multiply, underline. There's our answer. A lot of you got it, but I don't think it was more than about half the class. We'll see. Can I get this part? Um, essentially, let me ask the question, why is utility theory a part of this class? Is it important? Yeah, so you can make intelligent agents. OK, so utility theory assumes that, or utility theory is answering the question, how do you make decisions? The point of AI is how do you autonomously make decisions? Well, if you can convert your decisions into math, Bam, you did it. Um, at some level, every technique we study was built on top of utility theory. The one we haven't studied yet is game theory. Game theory is hugely dependent on utility theory. And I wish I had taught it so you would really see the point of this more. I was hoping to get there, but I kind of haven't gotten there yet. I'm trying to get to it. But um, search algorithms are vaguely built on utility theory. Game theory is built on it. Markov decision processes. Everything really builds on top of this. So if you understand it really, really well, you'll get a lot more out of search algorithms. You'll get a lot more out of chess, if we ever get to that, and the other algorithms that we get to. So I guess we're still in this trust me, it's important mode. But uh, I'd like you to be able to calculate how to make decisions. You'd be surprised how useful this is in life to be able to do things autonomously.
Any other questions on this problem? Great, let's move on. Number three, which one of these algorithms finds the optimal goal in the least amount of time when implemented properly? On the previous exam, right? Have I emphasized yet that I like to repeat myself? Huh? Have I emphasized yet that I like to repeat myself? <laughs> oh, so funny. I'm not funny at all. Which one of the following refinements would make the biggest difference in reducing the memory footprint of breadth first search? Um, that one. Right? That was good highlighting the other answer. You gave a lot of. Uh, I made people panic. <laughs> Can a star search offer computational improvements over breadth first? By the way, nobody has not taken the class yet, right? Or the test yet, right? <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't, you've just forfeited your opportunity by not excusing yourself before this class. Just okay. Can a star search offer computational improvements over breadth first search? The answer to that one was yes. Why? Under what? How can it offer computational improvements? It explores less of the space. It doesn't waste its time exploring potentially fruitless paths. That's a big deal. Okay. The purpose of the heuristic in A star search is <clears throat> no, no, wait, no. Why is it not to improve the quality of the solution? If quality is defined as time it takes to get it, then that's a valid answer. But it's not. Quality means the quality. OK, um, that was stupid. <laughs> <laughs> to ensure that there are no wormholes, uh, to reduce both computational cost, to promote diversity, to keep Manhattan as Wait, I missed it. Which one was it? Oh, it's that one. With me? OK. OK. By the way, when I do finally hand them back, if you have technical arguments with my answers, please bring them to me. I'm happy to debate technically. It is a technical class. I'd like to give you technically what you deserve. So it's OK to disagree with me. But if you can't defend it against my arguments, well, then you lose. Okay. Consider a path panning problem in which you know the starting state, several goal states. You want to find the lowest cost path to any one goal state. I added that, slightly different from the question on the previous exam, because the previous one was ambiguous. Can uniform cost search guarantee to find the best solution? The answer is yes. No one disagrees. OK. This one was a pleasure to grade, <laughs> because you all got it right, I think. I shouldn't have said that, because some poor person probably got it wrong and now feels bad. But um, I took part of this one and part of that one, separating at the same point, and I got that. And that is pretty much what most of you put, and that's a good right answer. Um, some of you randomly picked from each element. That is a type of crossover, but it is not single point crossover. That's multiple point crossover. So I did say do single point crossover, which means take a single point and cross over at that point. That's what it is. It doesn't have to be that point. If, in fact, you did just a G followed by that, that is a correct answer. If you did just this, is that a correct answer? That's kind of a degenerate case. <laughs> I'm going to say no. That just clones the parent. I would not accept that. I guess you could argue that it's a degenerate case of a correct answer. Um, anyway, moving on. <laughs> What would happen if you use tournament selection? What is tournament selection? Picking two random members of your population, have them do battle, and with some probability, the winner survives. And with some probability, the loser survives. And those two probabilities add up to one, and usually the probability of the winner surviving is greater than the probability of the loser surviving. Right? Okay. Running a full tournament where every pairwise agent competes with every other pairwise agent and then ranking them, that's not tournament selection. And as we learned from the crappy ball assignment uh, called sumo billiards assignment, that's a bad thing to do. Okay. 
Sorry, I'm still evolving this class. It will get better. Um, what would happen if the winter always survives? Would the population definitely get stuck in a local optimum? <coughs> Why not? There might not be a local optimum. There might not be one, but local might be the global. In which case, is it stuck in a local optimum? Technically, Technically global say. optima are local optima. So that case doesn't actually get us out. Um, notice we didn't even mention mutation here. Does making the winner survive with 100% probability remove mutation from the genetic algorithm? Not necessarily. Um, is it assumed that there is mutation in every genetic algorithm? I would say yes. Not, you can make it work without mutation, as long as you have diversity from other mechanisms. But it's kind of assumed that genetic algorithms at least have crossover, mutation, and selection. Those are kind of the standard. I'm going to say that unless you get rid of mutation too, this answer doesn't hold water. Okay? Does the population get more likely to become stuck in a local optimum? Yes. 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 Yeah. yes. It does. Why? Because, well, because this doesn't do much exp exploration, right? It's always going to drive <laughs> towards the local optimum whenever there's a tournament. You're relying on your mutation to get you out, or this topology of the surface finding a way to get you out. So yeah, you are more likely to get in the local optimum. So it is, the general wisdom of genetic algorithms is let the winner survive with a large but not 100% probability. And in my experience, closer to 50%, like maybe 55, 60, 70, usually works well if you're going to evolve for a darn long time. <coughs> okay, would it become vulnerable to plateaus? No. Um, let's come back to that one. What would happen to genetic algorithm if crossover was replaced with cloning? What is cloning? Yeah, copy the chromosome. Wouldn't that be cool if you could clone yourself? Would you live forever? It depends, it depends on your memories. Yeah, it depends. Are you the sum of your memories or are you the sum of your genes? Do your experiences count? Do your memories are your memories important or is only your genetics be important? As soon as you clone yourself, you'd start going to separate ones. Yeah, in my opinion, I think if I clone myself, I would get in a fight with my clone. We hate each other. I, I don't know. Also, your genetic code important with one hundred percent accuracy. Yeah. Also, I mean, if you clone yourself with the defects in your body going as well, in which case, how would you live forever and you're at the same level as you get? Ah, oh, that's a good point. Yeah, you want to clone a younger version of yourself. Well, that's the other question is, what if you clone one now and then say, okay, now in that one it's only going three, we'll have another clone and, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Like every 80 years making a new clone. But you'd have to clone a younger version of yourself, because otherwise... Right. You'd but every single time you're going to lose your experience. Right. <laughs> Excellent question. Um, okay. Well, my clone was the philosopher. Um, okay, how I graded this one. Notice it says circle all that are true. There are five distractors, or five possible options. This question is worth 10 points, so I made all of these worth two points. And that is, they're all true or false questions now. Might it still work? Yes. yes. It might still work because you still have mutation. There's still diversity. There's still selection. It could still work. Um, it loses its biological plausibility. Oh, well. Although bacteria gets on that way, so <coughs> apparently it still works. Would there be no diversity in the population? Mutation. Any goodness that evolved would not be preserved. That's, that's, a not real, that's kind of an orthogonal question, right? Um, cloning doesn't stop goodness from being preserved. As long as you still have selection of some type, it will. Okay. Would it become more select, susceptible to local optima? Uh, one really effective thing about crossover is it's really good at searching the space. And yet it doesn't search dumb parts of the space, it seems. 
And so for some reason it's really effective. Would tournaments become ineffective mechanisms for selection? Yeah. I don't know why they would, so no. This was the correct answer. What would happen in a genetic algorithm if no member of the population was ever killed and only one comp computing processor was available? Why do I say that? Because in the real world, imagine we all live forever, that would be totally different because we all run in parallel. Whereas if you run on a computer, you all run in serial. Totally different questions. I had to pick one. Um, would progress slow as the population grew? Probably. Kind of obviously, right? I mean, one processor is now working on more of the population. I think that's clearly true. Would randomly chosen parents be less likely to produce good children? Yes. yes. Yeah, because yes. from the dawn of time, there was only bacteria, right? And so if you're randomly picking back, if all the bacteria stays around, there's a darn lot of bacteria in your population. And if they're parenting all your children, you're going to have a lot of bacteria children. It's going to be less likely you pick the primates to have children. Okay, so that one's also true. I don't know if that was the best way to explain it. In your computer, your original random gene, random vectors are probably bad, right? If they're staying around forever, they're always possible choices. Okay. Diversity in the population would converge to zero. Exactly the opposite. You have a whole heck of a lot of diversity. Would it be more biologically plausible? Not really. Let me reword that. Is there death? <laughs> okay. Mutation would no longer serve any purpose. What? What am I doing? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, that was not correct. I'm just trying to make you panic here. It would serve a purpose still. Okay. Suppose there are four million amino acids. Four million? Did I say? Possible. Suppose there are four possible <laughs> amino acids. I'm going blind. G, A, T, and C. And each chromosome is made of 12 amino acids. Why am I giving you these numbers? Does it, does it matter? To throw a ball. I mean, it, no, it kind of matters. It kind of matters. Because if, if you've been running for a heck of a long time with a pretty not super expansive search space, then something's wrong with your like initial brand. That was my intention, and that the, this is a huge hint. So. A lot of you got the right answer without having seen that. But those of you who saw that, that was supposed to tell you what's going on here. What is 4 to the 12th power? You see, randomly pick one of these four 12 times. This is the total number of possible genomes in this entire problem, right? How many are there? 16 million. Do you agree? There are 16 million total things to evaluate. I have been running for 50 million iterations. 50 million is more than 16 million. Now think about this for a minute. If you've been running for 50 million iterations and you have not found anything that's satisfactory, what should you have done? Stop. <laughs> Stop, yeah. You should have just tried all 16 million. I mean, seriously, evaluate all 16 million. You will find the best one guaranteed Will an evolutionary optimization ever guarantee you found the best one? No. That's kind of its point, is it's a heuristic. It's good at finding things when you don't have time to, to run 50 million iterations. Um, the best possible answer was <coughs> just switch to brute force. <coughs> Try them all. <coughs> Abandon your dumb genetic algorithm <coughs> and test each genome. If you put that answer, you nailed this question. Um, it's okay that you didn't put that because I, a lot of you didn't do the math, really. You didn't take 4 to the 12th power, or if you did, you didn't catch the significance of, hey, that's less than the number of iterations I've been trying. But now, what does that tell us? If, uh, if we're searching for a long time and we're not getting better, what's going on? We are in a local optimum. It has to be, or else we would have found it, right? So. Or there's no diversity going on. It's one of those two. It's just a random <coughs> Excuse me. 
It could be our mutations are so super tiny, we're just not move, making progress very fast. I mean, could then another possible solution is there is no best agent? Or all agents are unsatisfactory. But we could have proven that about 35 million iterations ago <laughs> had we abandoned our genetic algorithm. So an acceptable answer, um, and by acceptable, I mean most of the points, would be answers that talk about how to promote diversity in a genetic algorithm. How, what are good ways to promote diversity? Change the 90%, 10% split on yeah, winner survival? Yeah, that's probably the best one, is if the chance of the winner survives is 0.9, that's saying the winners has a lot of, exerts a lot of pressure on the population. If you were to change that to say 0.6, the population is going to kind of drift a lot wider and farther and will be more likely to fall into better optima. Um, what about increasing the mutation rate? That'd be good. That would increase, that would increase uh, diversity. What about increase the number of iterations? Yeah. You're already at 50 million. It's not going to get better if you do 100 million. That's just... There's some reason you're not getting there by now, because 16 million is enough to try them all. Um, more is always better. <laughs> more is always greater, better, or equal to, as far as quality. In this case, yes, it'll be better, but maybe only a sliver, or maybe only a teeny, probably not at all better. But it won't be worse. More is never worse, except for how much electricity it burns, and the coal it burns to fuel the electricity, you're damaging the environment. Come on. Um, please limit your answers to six sentences. If you just said switch to brute force in one sentence, there's a full credit right there. If, if you went with reduce this, that's a lot of it. What if you said both of the other options? Yeah. Can the both of those answers be full credit? Because 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 uh, technically I've already run 59 iterations and then it's no good. And so if I can make a better genetic algorithm <laughs> that can find it in less than 16 million, isn't that technically a better solution? Well, or, or, yes, or, or, if you can beat 16 million, that is better. But if you had to do 50 million first in order to find it, but arguably then, not. So to brute force million. means I have to run another 16 million iterations. Yeah, That's but, true. Whereas, but there's also the fact that you just thought of that, I think. Unless I can find evidence in your writing that you didn't. I don't know. I need to look at the answers because if there's a lot of people that, that, that caught that, then I need to reward them a little bit more. If the best answer out there is uh, decrease the chance that the winner survives, then I guess I'll consider that pretty good. Yeah, I'm gonna, I need to go look at your answers. I'm sorry I haven't created it yet. I wish I had. Yeah, just because you're doing 50 million situations doesn't mean you're getting all the chance to maintain the million. Yeah, exactly. So this is not brute force. At this point, there's a pretty good chance you've got most of them. So you will probably have found the optimal one, but not for sure. Um, and the chance really depends on the rest of your algorithm and how good it is. What about, uh, what about increase your population size? It's pretty big, though. I mean, yeah, but... That's kind of debatable. I don't know how much of an impact that would make. If your population's big enough and they're all different, then yeah, you're exploring the space. But if it's bigger and they're all the same, then you're not. So you, if you increase your population, you need to also increase the diversity to get benefit out of that. OK. Um, Please contrast the genetic algorithm, genetic algorithms with A-star search and identify what kinds of problems are best suited for each algorithm. Again, please limit your answers. Um, <coughs> So I can't limit my six answers because there's a lot of stuff to say. And if you pick from these, I'll have to evaluate how good your choices were. But uh, what are some differences between genetic algorithm and A-star? Heuristic. Uh, yeah, so A-star has a heuristic. What about genetic algorithms? GA needs a fitness function or some way of doing tournaments. If you're doing tournament selection, you kind of don't need a fitness function, but you need an implementation of a tournament, which is basically a fitness function, 
which is basically a heuristic. So heuristic is not a big difference. I hope your answers don't lean too heavily on that, but there are here, there's a lot of heuristics in GAs. Uh, for example, when you do a tournament with 80% probability the winner survives, why 80? It's a heuristic. A heuristic's just a number you pulled out of somewhere because it felt good. And GAs are kind of the epitome of heuristics. It's, it's, uh, there's a lot of that. What is crossover? Well, it's a biologically inspired heuristic. So, yeah, they're, they're, that's a, kind of a similarity. A star is, an, uh, is a path planning algorithm. Genetic algorithms is a uh, optimization algorithm. What is the difference between optimization and planning? Planning, you need to know the goal state. Yeah, planning, you go from the start to the goal and you assume you have to do a whole bunch of steps to get there. Optimization, you just have a big vector. And you could encode in that vector a whole plan, or you could just be looking for a vector. So an optimization can arguably be a planning algorithm and more wrapped in one. Um, although arguably planning algorithms are more systematic and optimization algorithms are, if you're doing planning by optimization, you're kind of jumping around. They tend to not be as systematic, I guess. I doubt anybody mentioned that, because I don't think I mentioned that difference in class. Yeah. Okay. That was fine. Moving on. A star always gives the right answer. Does it not? If your heuristic is right. If. If your heuristic is not bad. GA never is the right answer. Unless you're lucky. <laughs> it gives a good answer. Gives a good answer. It always gives a good answer. And by always I mean unless it gives a bad one. <laughs> but unless you implement it bad. Yeah, that was <laughs> unless you implement it poorly, unless the problem's too hard, unless, unless, unless. Okay. There are problems where a GA can never even get a good answer. Can you give me an example? Uh, maze running. Uh, maze running, protein folding, uh, yeah, evolving humans, except it did. But we just can't seem to make it happen again, at least not in a computer. Okay. I mean, right. we had million, hundreds of millions of years because... Yeah, that's the other problem is we haven't run for billions of years and we haven't had enough processors. I mean, yeah. every single bacteria is running in parallel. So no matter how well we're simulating them, it's not quite comparable to the processing power of planet Earth. That's probably why. Moving on. Um, this is a really a big one though. A star gives the right answer. A star is computationally expensive. Right? Relatively speaking. Now that's not necessarily true. You can run a GA for as long as you want, and it depends on the problem and all that. But usually a GA comes up with a good answer pretty fast. A star comes up with the best answer after you've searched almost the entire space. Right? Um, a star almost always requires low dimensionality. This one's important to me. I, if you caught this one, that, that carries a lot of weight with me. Because if you have high dimensionality, your search space is enormous, right? You remember the whole exponential growth thing? If you have five values in three dimensions, you've got five, five to the third power, which is what, 125, very tiny. What if you have 50 dimensions? Five to the 50th power, big number. Um, if you have high dimensional space, A star is gonna choke. There's just gonna be too many possible states. A GA um, thrives on dimensionality. All right, what is the dimensionality of your genome? It's the number of bits in a CD, approximately. It's huge. It's a lot of stuff. OK. So if you picked three good ones on both sides or two really strong ones on both sides, you got it. it, it basically, I'm going to look at this one and think to myself, 
Do you get it? And if I feel like you get it, I'm happy. Okay. Did that one, did this one. I think we did the whole test. Hey. I'm sorry I can't pass them back. I'll get them to you as soon as I can get them graded. Um, darn students just keep bothering me with questions. Uh, <laughs> sorry, that one threw me for a minute. <laughs> that was a question, darn you. Okay, questions over for you. Stop asking me questions, please. Um, let's do our next assignment. I have 15 minutes, that's enough to make a little progress. This is today, assignment six is due here. I'm pretty sure that's enough time now. You've been looking at this assignment for a long time. But I gotta make sure I cover this well. So I'm gonna cover it today and I'll try to finish covering it on Thursday. And if I haven't covered it really well, we'll have to move it, but I think. <laughs> Yeah, so now you're going to try to ask me lots of superfluous questions. <laughs> Don't fight your own learning. You're paying for it, darn it. Okay. Assignment six, random forest. Let's start by looking at the starter kit. Yeah. Okay, are you getting overwhelmed with me giving you starter kits? <laughs> You're okay with that? Okay. I usually cringe when somebody gives me their code. The first thing I think is, I don't want to look at your code, I just want to write my own. Um, I don't think this is a lot. Let me show you what we've got. Let's start with main, because this is where it all begins. Okay, I have a class named main, and in here there's a public static void main, which calls test learner. Test learner runs three tests. It tests against hep, val, and soy. Have you looked at this yet? No. no. Yeah. Okay, well, by which you mean, please show us everything you can, because I want this assignment pushed back. Okay, I'll look. let's go look at those. There are, in this data folder, three data sets. One starting with hep, one starting with soy, and one starting with val. And by one, I mean four files. Um, let's open hep train sheet.arf. The, these files are in a format called arf format. Uh, arf stands for attribute relation file format. If you Google for arf format, Attribute relation file format. You can read all about it. You don't need to care, but basically, it's a format for storing a bunch of data in comma separated value form. Comma separated value is a nice, easy way to look at data. And if we look at this, see, comma separated values. Mm -hmm. And up here in attributes, this describes all of the columns. And we start by saying relation because you have to. That's the format. Anything that starts with a per, uh, percentage sign is a comment. So here's a bunch of comments. The title of this data set is hepatitis domain. The source is unknown or these. Came from CMU apparently. It's been used for these things. Please ask Gail Gong for further information. So go ahead, go ask Gail Gong if you want to know more about this data set. But here's what's in it. Um, well, let's look at the actual data. This is a bunch of stuff that somebody measured about people that have hepatitis, or maybe don't. Uh, we asked what their age was. It's a real number. So this person was 44. She was female. She was not on steroids. She was not taking antivirals. She was fatigued. She had malaise. Isn't that the same as fatigue? I don't know. Um, no, was not anorexic, yes, had a big liver, no, had a firm liver, 
Yes, had a palpable spleen. Uh, no, did not like spiders. <laughs> I think when you have hepatitis, it feels like there's spiders crawling over you. That sounds miserable. No, did not have ascites or varices. I wonder if those are veins. It sounds like spider veins. And yeah, that's what it sounds like. Okay, we've got a bilirubin number here, 0.9. Uh, I happen to have something called Gilbert syndrome, which means my bilirubin count is super high for no bad reason. So every time I go to the hospital, they panic and tell me I'm having hepatitis, and then they find out I have Gilbert syndrome, and then nothing happens. So I know a lot about bilirubin. Okay. And now I'm Or you tell them, though, I have I, I tell them whenever they draw my blood. And Eventually. They... Eventually. Once it stops being around with hepatitis treatments. Do you see what's going on? This is a bunch of symptoms. Okay, well now let's look at the next one. Hep train lab. <clears throat> die, live, live, die, live, 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 die, die, live, live, live. Are we going to play God? This is the That's exactly what we're doing. We're going to try to figure out, based on what we know of these people, here's what we know, and here's what happened. You're going to generate a machine that will take this as input and spit out, I'm sorry, you're going to die. Um, that's kind of cool, right? Okay. Kind of dark. Kind of dark. In the original data set, both of these values were combined into one data set. So there was another column here that said whether you live or die. And if you look in the comments, you'll see that. It says here, class live, die, live. I split them into two files because it's easier for you. I also split it into four files. That didn't quite come out right. Just listen to what I mean, not what I say. Um, there is hep test feet, hep test lab, hep te train feet, hep train lab. The two training files are for training, and the two testing files are for testing. Did you catch that? Yeah. Please don't make me explain it. Are you sure? <clears throat> Yes. Um, feature, feet is short for features, which means the symptoms, the things you can measure that are easily measurable. And lab is short for label. A label is a thing that you're interested in, the thing that's hard to measure. Basically, label is, are you going to die? Obviously, you can follow a patient around until they die, and then you know if they die, and then you go back in time and tell them if they were going to die, but that's <laughs> kind of worthless. So it'd be nice if we could train a machine on this training data so that it recognizes the features and predicts the labels. And then when we give it the features in the test data, it should predict the labels in the test data. And if it's a good model, it will get most of them right. Is there any difference in the content of the file between um, the testing and training? Yeah, so there was originally one big mass of data set. I split it into two pieces, and then I split them into columns of features and labels. So. Presumably, nobody that's in the training set is also in the test set. These are different human beings, and that means this is a hard problem. So it's hard to study these human beings and then evaluate on those human beings and always get the right answer. Your models probably will not get 100% accuracy, and that's okay. But if they're reasonably accurate, that's good. And here's the big question. Are they more accurate than a doctor? What's reasonably accurate? Um, I don't know. Let's find out. <laughs> let's see. You see well, what's reasonably really accurate for a doctor? Uh, that's not what I want. <laughs> Dang it, I don't even have this data set on here. But I have it on my office machine. Yeah, I think it's pretty common. Data, you see that I can pass. Okay. Equals. Learn cross validate hepatitis. I'll use a decision tree. That's it. With the decision tree, I was right 76% of the time. Now let me use random forest. Bag of 100 decision tree at random end. Dang it. Just your random tree was 76% good. Your 
decision tree with 70%? Uh, that was actually an entropy reducing decision tree, which will work a little better than yours. Um, random forest got 82% accuracy. Now, a good question we could ask is how accurate is a doctor? I don't know, but I do know that doctors can't just look at numbers like this and digest it and comprehend it and analyze it and compare it with statistical analysis. And the sad thing is doctors actually do amazingly well for what they are. Humans pull out strange ways of being intelligent. But machine learning algorithms are edging out the doctors. We can beat them. Your implementation will probably beat a doctor. So that's scary, yeah. What that means is if you had enough big data to train your models, you shouldn't go to the doctor anymore because he will mislead you. Trust your learning algorithms, they're smarter. <laughs> Unfortunately, learning algorithms can't put their arm around you and feel bad. They can't give you good recommendations. They can't do a lot of things doctors do. They won't charge you a fortune. Is this the um, data set? Is there a larger data set out there? I think this is the full data set as I found on my machine. And I found it on my machine after copying it from years ago. Uh, there is way more data out there. But this is some collection of data that I got from somewhere, and I have no idea where. So uh, I don't know how to answer that question. Yes. OK. Look up that one professor. He probably has more data sets. Probably. That one professor. I don't even know what you're talking about. The, the one that said, well, the contact <laughs> Oh, that one. <laughs> Okay, let's see. Soybean data sets. I only have two minutes left, so we're just going to look at the data and that'll be it. I will do more later. The large soybean data set. Uh, Basically, a bunch of farmers measured their soy plants. Here's a bunch of stuff about it. Here's a bunch of numbers. And the label that you're predicting is, is it diporthy stem canker, charcoal rot, rhizoconia root rot? Whoa. I don't know what you're predicting. Something to do with soybeans. How they died, OK. This is a vowel. The VAL data set's kind of cool. They took a bunch of human beings named Andrew, Bill, David, Mark, Joe, Kate, Penny, Rose, Mike, Nick, Rich, Tim, Sarah, Sue, and Wendy, and uh, they had them make vowel sounds in a microphone. Ah, ooh, ah, things like that. What was that again? <laughs> uh, it's online. You can, you can click it on my video. And uh, the... <laughs> These numbers here are what are called Mel frequency kepstrel coefficients. Essentially, you take the waveform of the recorded microphone, you uh, perform the Fourier transform, which gives you the spectral decomposition of this data, and then you do something to turn it around, which is why it becomes kepstrel instead of spectral, because kepstrel is spectral spelled backwards. And I don't believe that. Then you, oh, before that, you cluster it somehow, and you end up with these numbers. It's a standard way of analyzing audio data. And anyway, these numbers somehow represent what these people said in the microphone. And you're going to predict which vowel they said. Had, hayed, heed, hid, hood, hood, hayed. Did, move, yeah, that one. <laughs> OK, so we're going to train a bunch of models to do this stuff using decision trees. And I'm out of time. Hopefully, I'll have your test next time. Thanks for coming. Uh, so I'm very nice.